Well, hello and welcome to today's daily service. I'm really glad that you've chosen to engage here online. I want to open our service with some words from Psalm 34. Please join in aloud on those parts labeled all. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips together. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Let's pray. Father, we look to you now, and we ask that by your Holy Spirit, you would so work as we engage with Holy Scripture, that we would see the Lord Jesus anew. Show us his glory. We know that as we look upon him, our faces will become radiant, will be changed, to become more like him. We'll be drawn to put our faith in him anew and to follow him. Please, would you speak to each of us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope you've been engaging the daily services uh, throughout this week. And if you haven't, please, you must go back and uh, watch them from Monday. They've been excellent, my colleagues as usual, doing an incredible job as we've looked at Matthew chapter 18, piece by piece. And by this uh, morning's point in the story, Jesus has already been asked by his disciples, Lord, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And you can sense them kind of jostling for position, trying to get a leg up maybe on one another, trying to get the seat closest to Jesus' throne, you might say, in his kingdom. And so he draws a child into their midst and kind of sets some standing in the middle of the circle, a child being of the lowest standing and in that ancient society. And Jesus says, unless you change and become like one of these children, I guess willing to take that low position, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Remember, he had said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, right at the start of a Sermon on the Mount, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Not those who leverage themselves up, but who recognize their spiritual poverty and thus to turn in dependence upon God, unless you change and become like one of these little ones. And then, while focused on them, Jesus says about any of those little ones who believe in him, and here he seems to broaden out to include all of his disciples who humble themselves and become like one of these little ones, Anyone who puts a stumbling block in the way of one of his little children, my goodness, it would be worse if a heavy millstone were, were tied to their neck and they were drowned in the depths of the sea. And while we're thinking about that, he says to each of his disciples, be horribly deadly with sin. Cut it out of your life, he says, lest you're in danger of being drawn to hell. His words are poignant. And firm. And now at this point in the passage, he pivots again to look at the little ones and to have us think about them. Perhaps with an eye particularly on those who are weaker in the Christian community. Those that don't naturally, according to the world standards, have status. We might think of, of course, the children in church. We might think of the disabled. We might think of the weak and the elderly. We might think of the poor or the vulnerably housed in our midst. He brings to mind the little ones and now instructs us how we should treat them. Just think about the little ones in church that you know as I read these words. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. 
What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep than about the ninety-nine that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. One straightforward command. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. That word despise meaning to look down on or to scorn or to otherwise show contempt for. How do we treat the little ones in our midst? Do we inadvertently despise them? walk them by as we go on to those most important. It's a dynamic, a rumbling in each of our hearts to prioritize people by their worldly status. And Jesus says, it's all upside down in my kingdom. Do not despise these little ones. And he gives us first one heavenly reason as to why we should not do that. He speaks about the angels. And you and I don't talk about angels often. But they're very real, and Jesus wants us to know that they're real. They're kind of like the MI6 of the Bible. We don't see a lot of them. They don't come to the forefront of our day-to-day -day lives, but they play a vital role. Not, that one, that, not one that God needs, per se, but just as he delegated responsibility to humanity over his creation, and in his wisdom, he's created an angelic realm and given them responsibility to exercise a part of his work through them. Hebrews 1.14 saying, uh, aren't angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? And Jesus says, these little ones of mine, their angels are always standing in the presence of God. Imagine walking by Buckingham Palace in London and seeing one of these little ones from church standing outside the gates alone. Maybe we'd have a quick conversation with them, ask what they're up to. Maybe Maybe we'd quickly want to get on our way. But imagine instead that those palace guards with the tall black furry hats and the chin straps and the beautiful red coats with the white straps and the rifle and the jet black shoes, imagine that a number of them were gathered around that little one. And two of them march from the crowd and we see them heading back off into the palace. And as we look, we see Her Majesty herself standing in the window. And suddenly those two palace guards appear in view in her presence, clearly relaying to Her Majesty what's happening with the little one at the gate. Wouldn't that change our view of their importance? They're angels, Jesus says. Always see the face of my Father in heaven. One heavenly reason for not despising the little ones, now one very earthly and familiar story. We told an expanded version of it as recorded in Luke chapter 15 to show that when one sinner repents, there's more rejoicing in heaven than 99 who don't need to repent. And here he doesn't apply it to the, the repentant sinner, but he applies it to his little ones. Think of it this way, a COVID ward with a hundred patients. 99 easily recover, but one begins to languish. Does not all, all, the whole team of doctors and all of the nurses gather around and work to sustain the life of that one ailing patient, in a sense, drawing their attention away from the 99 to focus on the one on death's door. And when that one comes through, is there not more rejoicing in that COVID ward over that one patient who recovered than all the 99 who came through more easily so? Similarly, Jesus is saying, verse 14, in the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones will perish. Do not despise my little ones. Their angels are standing before me in my presence. They're that important to me. I'm not willing that a single one of them be lost. They won't be. So love them that way. Why don't we pause and begin with uh, some words of confession as we turn to prayer before song. Drawing to mind those times where we have maybe inadvertently despised God's little ones. Merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the schemes and desires of our own hearts. 
and have broken your holy laws. We have left undone what we ought to have done, and we have done what we ought not to have done. Yet, good Lord, have mercy on us. Restore those who are repentant, according to the promises declared to us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant, merciful Father, for his sake, that from now on we may live godly and obedient lives to the glory of your holy name. Amen. And let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And Father, now we draw to mind those little ones, those more vulnerable, those weaker in the world's eyes, and we thank you for them. We pray for your blessing and protection upon them, and pray especially during this COVID season that you would enable us, your church, to care for the weakest in our number, knowing how much you regard them and love them. And now a prayer for families during this half term. Would you join in aloud with me? Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, whose Son, Jesus Christ, shared at Nazareth the life of an earthly home. Bless our homes, we pray. Help parents to impart the knowledge of you and your love, and children to respond with love and obedience. May our homes be blessed with peace and joy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our song today focuses us on our King of Love. Let's sing it aloud together.
Well, it's been lovely to have you join us today. Let's close our service with the words of the grace said aloud together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you.